Welcome again for another. Hi, it's week five. My gosh, I'm so excited yet again to be hanging out with you all to do yet another virtual astronaut challenge. We do have yet another big week that's come on up and uh, really, really glad to have you wherever you are joining right across Australia. Now, before we get going, uh, I'm hanging out with you. Uh, I am on Western Sydney land on Durrad country. I really want to acknowledge uh, the traditional custodians of the country I'm on, Durrad country. And also we're connecting to uh, all sorts of places right across Australia and beyond everywhere, right across the world too. And uh, I want to acknowledge all Indigenous, Indigenous custodians from various lands from where you are. I want to pay respects to our elders past, present and emerging. And I want to extend a real good day to any Indigenous people hanging out with us today. We do have quite a uh, session today. I know we've gone up to week four, but hey, it's week five now. And we are now at looking at the iteration and evaluation of your project. And we've got some very special guests as well. So Jackie, it's right if we could just go to our uh, our current people, if, if, if we could, uh, to uh, sort of work out what who we've got here. We have Scott, if I may, could you please say good day? And uh, we'll see what that is you've been getting up to lately. Morning, everybody. Coming to you from Wanarua land in the beautiful Hunter Valley. I am absolutely stoked about what we've got for you today. And I'm going to be interviewing the amazing Dr. Carl and introducing uh, the equally amazing Dr. Adrian Brown today. So stay tuned. Thanks so much, Scott. And now we've got all those grey screens out of the way. Uh, Dr. Carl. Amongst all the things that you do, I really love the uh, work you've done with belly button fluff. Uh, that was amazing. And in fact, I was able to work out what causes belly button fluff and why it's almost always blue. What causes it? Well, it's a mixture of fibres of clothing, dead skin cells and fibres of hair, all held together by the you know, dead skin cells. And why does it end up in the belly button fluff? In the belly button? Because all hairs on the abdomen point to the belly button in the same way that all roads lead to Rome. And Harvard University showed me so much respect that they um, flew me to uh, Harvard and provided accommodation entirely at my own expense. They wouldn't insult me by offering me money to cover it. That's how highly regarded the Ig Nobel Prize is. I love it. I love how science can take you anywhere. Who would have known it can take you down into belly buttons? <laughs> That's awesome. Hey, we also have Dr. Adrian Brown. Uh, Adrian, would you like to say g'day? G'day, Ben. Uh, g'day, everybody. Um, I am a, a, a NASA scientist uh, in Washington, D.C., and I work on the Mars 2020 project, uh, which is uh, about nine months into its uh, voyage on Mars. Uh, and uh, eventually we'll be returning samples from Mars. Um, and this behind me is an image of our uh, landing uh, as it happened nine months ago. Fantastic. Really looking forward to what you can share. Hey, what we're about to discover with new research coming on in. And Alan, we've hung out with you before. We've learned a bit about business innovation. Uh, how's your morning been today? It's absolutely fantastic. Thanks, Ben. And it's great to be here again. I'm coming to you from Camaragal country from the Yonora Nation, uh, which means I'm sitting in Crow's Nest, Sydney. And I look forward to chatting to everybody. Thanks, Ben. Thanks so much. Now, uh, someone a little bit north of uh, that country is Kylie. Kylie, Barrett, would you like to say hello, please? Hi, everyone. It's fantastic to be here with you today. And I've got the amazing Glenny D with me. And we are coming to you from Wabakul country here in Newcastle. We'll be looking at some designs coming straight out of the classroom today with some fabulous questions for our expert panellists. So we are super excited and keen to dive in. And uh, we'll have a shout out later on to some of those schools. So keep watching. Uh, really looking forward. Let's keep travelling further north. Uh, Wendy, tropical north Queensland, how is it today? Hi, everyone. Here I am in Townsville, North Queensland, land of the Wulgarukaba and Bindle people. It is getting hot. But I just want to say happy National STEM Day next week. Today's lesson, though, we're going to take your thinking to a whole new level. Yeah, absolutely. That's very, very true. And someone who does a lot of thinking is Ian down in the south. How are you doing there today? Yeah, I'm doing well, Ben. I uh, hope you're doing well also. Um, I'm coming from Griffith in New South Wales, uh, Radjuri country. Um, 
home of the New South Wales Virtual STEM Academy, and I'm really looking forward to seeing some of the questions from students of Murrumbidgee Regional High School being posed to Dr. Carl. So I know there's lots of uh, lots of kids out there watching, and today is going to be absolutely fantastic. Oh, thanks so much. So with all those introductions done, let's kick off week five. And uh, Scott, we have a lot of questions that have come in from schools all over the country for Dr. Carter to really uh, talk to. So Scott, what, what, what's going on there? Oh, look, Dr. Carl is going is amazingly um, offering his time again. He's a great friend of the New South Wales Department of Education and tirelessly gives his, his time. But Dr. Carl, I just want to sort of do, do a bit of an introduction because he absolutely loves science and he's been spreading the word of science uh, on TV, in print, on radio. Uh, if you're a Triple J fan, you, you would be well aware of his work. And he's been doing that for 30 years now, almost as, as old as me. So also, I don't know if you're aware of this, but he's the author of 47 books. Amazing, 47 books. Imagine, uh, I can't even imagine reading that many books. There's one behind me here. Uh, and he has been a student himself. So we're, talk, we're all students here, but he has been a lifelong learner. So think about this. He has degrees in physics, mathematics, biomedical engineering, medicine, and surgery. He's worked as a physicist, a labourer, a roadie for a band, a car mechanic, a filmmaker, a biomedical engineer, a taxi driver, a weatherman, and an actual medical doctor in a um, children's hospital. What an amazing career. And we're just so lucky to have him today. And he's going to answer some questions that are posed from some of the 6,000 students that are involved in this program. Amazing. And we're going to start off with, as Ian has suggested, uh, a, a question that's come from Laura from um, his school and cue video. Hi, my name is Laura Wepler and I'm in year 10 at Murrumbidgee Regional High School in Griffith, New South Wales. My question is, could we make chemical reactions in the air with greenhouse gases to take them out of the atmosphere? And how big a scale of reaction would be needed to make a difference? Ah. Laura, yes, um, message of hope here. We can both stop and reverse uh, rising carbon dioxide levels and climate change <clears throat> and bring conditions back to what they were before you were born. Can we do it with chemical reactions? Yes. Remember the unofficial motto of the US Air Force, which is with enough energy, you can do anything and pigs can fly. So you can do that. And the trick is to find the more efficient ways. So trees are really good at doing it. And there are many, many ways to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. This is called carbon sequestra sequestration. The methods that we're thinking of at the moment range from fully military industrial, where you just get a big machine and you throw electricity at it, all the way to biological, like growing plants in the ocean and everything in between, including biochar. And yes, there are many, many ways that we can do it. And <clears throat> we have the technology to do it now. We can get, fix 90% of global warming simply by stopping, by keeping fossil fuels in the ground. And then we have to start adding to nature, which will pull the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And we just add to that. And we can bring conditions back to what they were before you were born. The message of hope. Uh, go to the website drawdown.org, drawdown.org. And they deal with a whole bunch of different methods. Happy reading for a couple of hours there. That's, that's awesome. Um, We've also got um, a question here from Beatrix, which is uh, a year five student from Ruxton um, Girls um, School in Melbourne. So we're coming from all over Australia today. And this one's a really interesting one to me because it, it really sets the scene for what we're doing the, uh, on the moon, uh, and which has been a big part of this project and about being able to grow food because to grow food, we need water. And the, the question is, does ice or water on the moon have different properties to ice and water on Earth? 
We'll find out when we get there, but almost certainly yes. Now, you think of water existing in three states. There's that invisible gas called steam, traditionally above 100 degrees C. Then between 100 and zero, you've got this liquidy stuff. And then from zero down, you've got this thing, which is just called ice. It turns out that there are at least 19 different crystalline forms of ice. Let me explain. <clears throat> Suppose you've got a totally square cubic cardboard box, boom, cardboard box, and you put one molecule of water on each corner, one, two, three, four at the top, and down the bottom, one, two, three, four. That's called a cube, and that's called a corner cube. Now, suppose that you keep those one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight molecules of water there, and then you show another one in the middle, that then become right in the floating in the middle of the body. That becomes a face centered cube. And then if you add a molecule of uh, water on each face, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six faces, you then end up with a face centered cube. There are 19 different phases of water. And if you cool down water quickly, you'll end up in one of three different crystalline shapes. And if you cool down slowly, you get another three. And there are just so many more depending on how you do uh, the, the cooling and what's happening. The most common form of ice is called ice 1H, H for hexagonal. And it has tiny amounts in it of ice 1 cubic called H1C. And then there's 19 or 17 other different phases. So will we find different ice? Yes, we're learning so much about water. Will we be able to use it? Almost certainly. That's awesome. Uh, I've done a lot of work in metallurgy and those terms when they talk about um, the crystalline structures with metals is, is um, very similar too. So I, I wasn't aware that ice was the um, acted in the same way, Dr. Carl. So I'm learning some great things today as well. Uh, next question is from um, the Junction Public School, which is going to feature a bit today. Um, mm -hmm. they've, they've been doing a lot of work in the AVA program and thank you for, for, for being involved. But this one's a really cool question too. And it's something that I would like to get involved with in the future. So what are your views on this? Will there ever be a space hotel or resort on the moon, Dr. Carl, is the, is the question from Alicia. Uh, once again, with enough energy, a pig will fly. So we are heading that way. We do have to become a space-going race for the following reason. We've got to preserve uh, the human race. In, on, on Halloween, uh, 31st October in 2015, a rock 0.6 of a kilometre just missed us. And had it impacted with the Earth, it would have killed between 10 and 70% of all humans, depending on whether it landed in the dead heart of Australia, the Pacific Ocean, or a supervolcano. Had we had three years warning, and it, and was it on a uh, and had it been on a impact a collision course, we could have pushed it aside. We didn't have three years warning; we had three weeks. So. Part of us becoming a space-going race is having accommodations, habitats, hotels, call it what you will, all through the solar system. And the moon's really good. We're very lucky to have such a convenient place so close to us and with a decent gravitational field, roughly one-sixth of our own. So the health issues are not too major. Awesome. Uh, next question again is from the Junction Public School, and this is a big call out to Alice, because Alice actually wants to be an astronomer for, for NASA when she grows up. But um, Alice, don't forget there is an Australian Space Agency and um, there are jobs that are coming. So in the future, you may be able to work um, for the Australian Space Agency uh, as well as NASA uh, in the future. And of course, we've got Dr. Adrian Brown, who's an Australian that's working for NASA right now. So an aspiration which is definitely available. But her question is, does the moon have lava tubes? And if it does, could you live in them? Well, um, read the um, oh, series by Fred Pohl, P-O-H-L, um, and this is a whole series of science fiction books, Gateway, I think they're called Gateway, and what it says is that there are, this science fiction book, lava tubes on the moon, in other words, where there was volcanic action and then the lava flowed away, but it cooled at the surface, leaving behind these tubes underground, and you can see them in various parts of Australia, including Cairns. 
he meant from Cairns. And then when we humans go to the moon, we find alien spaceships there, read on for the rest of the science fiction story. Did Mars, ha- did the moon have enough volcanic activity to do so in the early days? Unfortunately, I don't know. Now, somebody who would is somebody who's coming on later, Dr. Adrian Brown, who actually is inside at NASA. And so he might know more, or he might not, about the planetary geology of the moon, whether there was enough volcanic activity to have lava tubes. And by the way, I was reading an article yesterday which said that it were black holes <coughs> to go and hit the moon, they would just burrow straight through, leaving behind a hole, uh, which is not a lava hole. Uh, and it's not science fiction, but it's a different thing again. Answer, don't know. Uh, awesome. Uh, we've got an, a video question again from uh, the wonderful Murrumbidgee Regional High School. We'll be call out to um, to that one of the one of the leading STEM schools in, uh, in Australia, oh. uh, and it's from Digby Jones. So, um, Q video. I'm Digby Jones. I'm in year eight at Murrumbidgee Regional High School, Griffith, New South Wales. My question is, what is dark energy? Ah, dark energy is real. And Brian Schmidt, who is the Vice Chancellor of the Australian National University, shared a Nobel Prize for it a few years ago. Dark energy, if you turned into mass by E equals MC squared, accounts for 70% of the mass of the universe. We know it's real, what it's doing, and it began about 5 billion years ago out of the age of the universe of 13.8. 5 billion years ago, the fabric of space-time began to accelerate faster and faster and faster, and it's still doing it now. Um, And this is caused by something that we call dark energy. We know that the expansion began then, this extra expansion, and it's going faster. We don't know where it'll end up, and we definitely right now do not know what dark energy is. But just for you, Dr. Digby, here's a prediction. By the time we get to the end of this century that we're in now, and remember, predictions are very difficult to make, especially about the future, your kids or nephews or nieces or family members at the end of the century will be playing as a toy you know, under the age of 10, with one of the following things. The missing eight dimensions of space, dark matter, dark energy, or a black hole. And you'll say, Digby, now come inside and eat your lunch and stop playing with the black hole and stop playing with the dark energy. Anyway, that's my prediction. Could be wrong. <laughs> nice. I, I really love this question. I've got a question here from a, uh, as an anonymous person, actually. But how large would a bucket of water have to be to put out the sun? The trouble is it might actually help the sun keep on burning. You see, the sun doesn't do chemical burning. Think about atoms. Atoms have got a very small, dense core, microscopic, and then supposedly lots of empty space, and then electrons on the outside. Most of the energy that we get um, from human activity comes from chemical energy, where you get one atom and another atom, and you swap the electrons around. Carbon plus oxygen gives you carbon dioxide plus a lot of heat. The sun does nuclear burning, and every second it burns 620 million tonnes of hydrogen. Not 620 tonnes, 620 million tonnes. Now, it's at a temperature of around 15 million degrees, and what you're going to be doing if you tip in larger and larger amounts of water, you're going to be tipping in hydrogen atoms, and they'll be fuel for the nuclear fires. You'll be giving it more fuel. The trouble with the sun and why it's going to go out eventually or change state is it's going to run out of nuclear fuel. So if you chuck water onto the sun, that's kind of like throwing petrol onto a chemical fire. So it wouldn't make the sun go out. It'd actually make it live longer than its projected five year, five million year span, sorry, five billion year span, where it expands out to a red giant and then shrinks down to a white dwarf roughly the size of the Earth. Sorry to break your heart. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Uh, we've got a question here from Thomas. Now, it only says CHAC, so I'm not sure where that is. But C-H-A-C. the question really goes, I think, to um, what we're going to see from Dr. Adrian Brown um, later on. Um, he's got images of Mars, and we see Mars as like being very rocky and dry compared to the Earth. And um, the question that um, he has is that why are a lot of planets like this? Why are they so rocky and dry compared to Earth? 
Um, uh, this is a complicated thing. It turns out that the, firstly, that we have discovered lots of other planets outside our solar system. The ones that are rocky like Mars, there's one of those in our solar system, which is Mars. And then there's Venus, but it's very, very hot. And then Earth is sort of like about one third rock and two thirds ocean. The rest of the planets in the solar system, the, oh, okay, and Mercury is rocky as well. So when they're getting further out, they're turning into gas giants. Jupiter and Saturn, and then ice giants. Now, here's a weird thing. We started really finding planets outside our solar system with Kepler, and we discovered maybe three or 4,000. Now, here's a really weird thing. The most common form of planet we've discovered does not exist in our solar system. It's a planet called a super Earth, somewhere a few times bigger, somewhere in size between a few times bigger than Earth all the way up to Neptune. And we don't have any of those in our solar system. So we're still trying to understand planetary evolution. Um, the old one was that the planets all formed in the early days and they condensed out of this cloud of gas. And uh, then the wind, then the, the sun fired up and then um, it started blasting out radiation in all directions of solar wind, one million tonnes of charged particles every second. And so it blew away the atmospheres of the inner planets like Mercury and it didn't have much effect on the outer planets, which stayed cold. And we've kind of realized it's not that simple. We, um, and so the latest theory is called the, the Big Tack or the Grand Tack, T-A-C-K, referring to a change of direction that a sailing ship can do. And so we think that we had a whole bunch of super Earths in the early days, and then Jupiter came in, and then with its gravitational field, broke them up into smaller things, and some of them coalesced back into, uh, they would have coalesced into a, a, something like a super Earth, but what happened was that Saturn came in behind Jupiter. So Saturn and Jupiter came in together, and then Saturn then pulled Jupiter out again. It is not that simple, and I'm waiting to see what people like Dr. Adrian Brown come up with, uh, Brown come up with uh, from NASA in their planetary science studies. Don't know. Yeah, and maybe that's something that our, our future um, astronomers and astronauts and space experts that are on here today might may discover more as well, Dr. Carl. Ah, another question here now. I've, I've loved this. This is Ava. But what a great name um, to um, call up a question, Ava, which is also our acronym for, for this, uh, this program. But uh, Ava, again, is from uh, Murrumbidgee, um, who have been very uh, prolific in, in being involved in this program, as I've said before. And her question is, if hot air rises, why is space so cold? Ah, for a great physicist, um, uh, Richard Feynman was asked, what, what would be the one bit of information that you would pass on to future generations if all knowledge was lost? If all knowledge was lost, then you could send only one sentence back down into the future to people 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 years from now, what would that sentence be? And this is what he came up with. And this answers your question. It's in two parts with a comma in the middle. All matter is made up of atoms. That's the first part, comma. And here, here's the answer to your question, which if they're too close together, they repel each other. But if they're too far apart, attract each other. Why they repel each other? That's, that's fairly straightforward. Why they can attract each other, look up van der Waals forces. So um, when you have, oh, and I'll do a Swiss experiment. Are you ready to do this experiment with me, Dr. Scott? Oh, yes. Okay, right. <laughs> we're, we're throwing you in here to do the experiment. Now, I want you to blow onto the palm of your hand with your mouth wide open and tell me if it's hot or cold. It's warm. Okay. Now, with the same mouth and the same palm of hand and the same distance, but with your lips in a tiny little hole, blow onto your hand. Yes, it's cold. Right. So the atoms have been compressed in your mouth. They come out and they want to get back to their natural distance. Want. I'm being a bit, you know, giving them human feelings. They want to get back to their natural distance. They need energy to do that. Where does the energy come from? From the surrounding atmosphere. So as you go up a mountain, the air molecules get further apart. They don't like being further apart. They need energy to do it. Where they get that from the surrounding air so the temperature goes down. That is a fairly 
basic Mark 101 answer to your complicated question. And the space itself has an average temperature of about three uh, degrees above absolute zero. And I, I just love this. Did you know that you can get tardigrades, which are a little creature uh, with eight legs, about uh, a tenth of a millimetre to a millimetre long, and you can take them down to two degrees above absolute zero, two, not 200, two, and then bring them back to room temperature and they will survive. And you can keep them on the outside of the International Space Station for a couple of weeks and they'll survive. My God, what are these crazy creatures? <laughs> amazing, amazing. The time has flown, Dr. Carl. We're, we're at the, the end of the time we've got for this, but um, I'm hoping that you can stay around so that we can um, be involved in the next presentation with Dr. Adrian Brown. So I know you're a very busy man. Um, but... Um, so I just want to introduce Dr. Brown um, because uh, he's an amazing um, Australian. He was originally from Melbourne um, and he's made all his way to Washington, D.C. as the Deputy Program Scientist for the NASA's um, 2020 uh, Mars mission. But like Dr. Carl, he's got a, a, an amazing career. He's completed research in areas of Mars, astrobiology, remote sensing. He's worked in computer science, electrical engineering very passionate about aerospace, uh, as you might imagine. But here's an interesting thing. He's also a pilot, and he also served in the Royal Australian Navy. So he's had a, a very big career. Um, in 2006, he was selected to be part of the NASA Ames Research Centre um, and became a research scientist and also worked with the SETI Institute. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, SETI Institute was also about finding alien life was part of the, the brief as well, um, Dr. Brown. Um, I, know, I don't know if that's what you're involved with, but uh, I have heard of the SETI, SETI program. And of course, he's currently in the, in the role. So we're very lucky to have um, Dr. Brown here. But Dr. Brown, we're just going to go on a little tangent because Dr. Carl is, is giving you a bit of a challenge. And he's asked is about those um, lava um, vents. So before we get started, are you able to um, illuminate that idea about the, the lava tubes? Yes, yeah, yeah, definitely. So the, the lava tubes are definitely, um, definitely probably there on, on the moon. Um, we have on, the only evidence, the thing with a lava tube is we can't really tell by uh, photography very easily. We have to look for openings into the lava tube that can be photographed by our uh, orbital instruments, our cameras. And then we see uh, something that looks a little bit like a, a, the deck of a, an aircraft carrier or something like that, where you have a hole in the middle of it and you can see the shadow of the sun going into that hole. And that's the, that, that's the primary method we have at the moment of detecting lava tubes. And once we get things like uh, ground penetrating radar down onto, onto the moon, um, that'll be a much more effective way of mapping them uh, underneath the surface. And that um, brings me the, the, the chance to mention that the rover that you see in the picture behind me has a ground penetrating radar. That's this big box right here. That's a ground penetrating radar right there. And I can tell you the data that we're getting is um, fascinating. We're looking at uh, beneath the surface and finding hints about the stratigraphy or the, the layering under the, under the uh, landing site. Um, and uh, we haven't found any lava tubes there, but we do know from the same orbital technique that there's lots of lava tubes on Mars. Uh, in particular, around Olympus Mons, there's lots of uh, openings uh, and uh, caves caused by lava tubes around Olympus Mons, the biggest, biggest volcano in the solar system. Ah. Um, Dr. Adrian, is it true that you're very confident that there used to be water on the surface of Mars? And if so, how, how, how long ago was it found and, and how did you discover it? Absolutely. So um, that's, uh, we can answer that question in many different ways. Uh, we have discovered water on Mars many different ways, many times. Uh, and we've, we know that there's water in the polar regions. We've known that for, um, for as long as uh, we've had telescopes to look at Mars. So. Um, Galileo was aware of things like that. Um, so we had, we've had uh, water on Mars on the mind, but of course we haven't had liquid water 
um, as close as we have in our mission now. So on the Mars 2020 mission, we've landed right next to this amazing delta. Uh, you, to form a delta, you really need liquid water. Uh, and our, our delta is amazing. We just published a paper on it, in fact, in science about the fact that we've found huge one meter size boulders uh, in the side of this delta. Uh, and it's, it's to, if, if you think of, a, of, of going to somewhere where a, a delta is forming here, like uh, in the Mississippi region in the United States or in uh, the Egyptian uh, delta, uh, then it, to think about seeing a one meter boulder go by, that's a big flood that, um, that has to be uh, happening to move that much material around. So this has really transformed our understanding of, of this particular delta. And we're, we're, this is only by looking at it with our remote sensing uh, images at the moment. And we're, uh, we're going to see amazing more detail when we get up close to it. So I imagine you call it a delta because it looks like a pyramid, and that's the Greek symbol for delta. How big, uh, you know, so the river comes down towards the ocean and it spreads out. How big are river deltas in on Earth? And how big, because if you say you're on a river delta that used to exist in the past, how big is it across? Is it like 100 metres or 100 kilometres or what, what sort of scale? So the, the delta that we have on um, Mars 2020 is... Um, we're in a crater called Jezero Crater, and the crater is about 40 kilometers across. Wow. And the delta, the delta fills up just a little corner of it, in fact. At the moment, we, what, from what we can see, it's about 10 kilometers across, uh, but it may have filled more area inside the crater and then been eroded back over time because we know from uh, looking at the numbers of craters that landed on top of the, the delta, uh, and there's a big one, there's a big one kilometer across crater in the middle of it. So we know that it's a really ancient crater and at a, at, we estimate that it's maybe around 4 billion years old. Um, but we want to get a better number. We're scientists and that, uh, that's going to be a big focus of the, the, our mission is collecting samples from the delta uh, and many samples from the delta to really tie down uh, a really good data on that delta and, 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 and try to... Um, put corners on the end of the um, of when this water event was happening. How, uh, how long was the water present for? How long did it take to form the delta? Those questions are going to be stunningly interesting for the, the geomorphology types of our uh, planetary science community. Dr. You Brown, you've got, some, um, you've got some imagery of that, um, I believe, in your, yep. um, uh, for your slide presentation. Do you want to throw up... Uh, a couple of those um, slides and um, explain, and you said about the samples too. I think you've got some um, some imagery there of uh, how those samples were taken. Yes, I do. Let me just um, let me just scroll through here to the delta uh, section. So, um, so this uh, this is our recent paper in Science where we we're. Um, um, looking at what what we termed the flood deposits, so we, it, it wasn't just a normal delta event. We were talking about flood deposits, and it, we, they came from this image of the of a these um, this particular uh, feature, which is actually just a little bit it's offshoot of the delta. It's actually on the delta itself. It's a little closer to us, and we were able to photograph it in stunning fashion. And you can see the layers inside of it, and and in those layers. We resolved meter, the meter sized boulders. So Excuse it was me, Dr. Brown. Here. There, there's, <laughs> yeah. a, there's an image right in front of your image that we, we're seeing coming through. Um, I don't know, it says right. warning. Uh, are you oh, able to um, remove that? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. Let me see if I'm. It's still on there. Yeah. There's a thing that says, don't, any computer, don't warn me when I open this presentation. This image may look different. Here's a list of what changed. So if you hit the button at the top left and activate it, it might go away. It's still sitting there uh, in the front. Yeah, that one there. That help? Hooray! That's it. Perfect. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, that's oh, that's a stunning image that. too. Yeah, go yeah. full screen. So this is the um, – let me do, um, zoom in on this uh, bad boy here. So you can see these layers, and these were, these images were taken by our Mars Cam Z uh, um, 
And in particular, the Mask MZ is on the, the, the mast of the rover. And in particular in here, we're interpreting these things as the boulders uh, in this Kodiak, we call this uh, offshoot Kodiak. Uh, and uh, of the Delta, this is, uh, um, well, the Delta is gonna be even more exciting when we get to that. And, and potentially that'll, will show, you know, maybe we won't find as many boulders uh, and that will show us some interesting variations in the water flows into the, um, into the water system of the Jezero Crater. Uh, and so uh, I also should point out, you asked about how we're sure that uh, Dr. Carla, we've, we've got water, on, we had water on Mars when this was forming. Well, so the Delta has to have liquid water. It can't be, um, uh, it can't be ice or anything like that. It has to have liquid water because how the Delta is formed is that it has an inflow channel into the crater and the channel actually uh, slows down the water. And um, as it, pours out into the um, exposure, it sort of spreads itself out and forms this, this huge deposit. So to form that delta, you need the water to, uh, to you need to have the water in a lake form to, to slow down the, the river and have the river, river pump the sediments into the lake and then slow down and form this delta as, it slow, as the water is slowed down and it can no longer hold those sediments, it has to drop them out onto the floor of the crater. And that's how this, this feature formed. So we know that there wasn't just water, um, but there was a lake there. And so we've known that lake has been there since about 2005. This was identified by the Mars uh, orbiting camera on um, uh, the Mars Global Surveyor. This delta was uh, first recognized, but now we know so much more about it by visiting, uh, by visiting it. And we're gonna learn so much more when we get the samples back. Uh, and those samples will be coming back in about uh, 2030. So in, um, for any young uh, uh, planetary scientists out there, you may get a chance to be the first to crack these samples open uh, and analyze them in your lab. It'll be an international um, uh, effort to, to uh, analyze these data, just like the lunar samples from the Apollo region. The Apollo times have, have uh, fueled our knowledge of the moon. We expect that these will do the same thing for Mars. Wow. You mentioned uh, that the samples. Let me just show you the Mars sample return um, yeah. uh, aspect of this, um, this mission. So um, tell me if this is uh, working. So, yeah, okay. mm -hmm. you're full screen. Great. So this is the first. Uh, so I'm going to uh, make a small admission here. And um, our first sample, we actually made a mistake as a team. Uh, Everything is doing really, really well with the rover and, and we were feeling really good about the landing and everything was working perfectly. But then when we first uh, went to a site where we tried to get a sample out of the ground, we, we didn't understand how friable, how, how soft and easy to break the rocks would be. Uh, and so what we think happened is we drilled just like they do in the JPL lab because they have a copy of this rover in the JPL lab and so they've They've, uh, they did uh, tests on terrestrial rocks in terrestrial environments, that is on the earth in, in Pasadena in, in California. And so they had, they had a, a model for how the, the rocks should perform, how hard they should be. And unfortunately, the Martian, first Martian rock we, we, uh, we drilled into more or less fell apart, unfortunately. And, and we uh, unfortunately we only found out when the sample was was uh, loaded into the rover and, uh, and, and imaged and there was nothing there. So, so this is our actual first successful sample taken. Uh, in this image, this is a sort of a, a selfie of the rover uh, after the dual samples were taken because we're going after dual samples because you can learn so much more when you've got two tubes of pretty much the same material. Um, it's very valuable to have those. So those were taken on that rock there, which is called Rochette. You can see that down the bottom of the of the screen, uh, and the rover is very proud of itself um, for taking those samples. Uh, and and just to give you some idea, we've put a lot of planning into the um, into the uh, so-called model or baseline mission. Uh, we had ideas about how many samples we take of, of each of these different types of rocks that we could see from orbit, uh, and then now we've uh, sort of um, uh, screwed that up a little bit with, uh, with our first sample, uh, but we're calling it, instead of calling it a failed sample, we call it the atmospheric sample. So 
So, um, uh, so that's uh, that's us for uh, <clears throat> for ingenuity, shall, shall we say? And I'll I'll just show this quick video, um, and this actually will give you an idea of we went through this process with our first sample, and uh, uh, and the drill goes in, and at this point we think that we lost the rock just there as it was coming up. And now we've designed into the next, um, oops, let me see that again. I just wanna show you that. Okay, maybe we won't get that. All right. So we've added into this uh, a check from the, the mask instruments for the uh, rover, which happens just about here. So here, this is where the sample is going up to the sample tube to enter the rover, where it's stored on board the rover. Uh, and then at that point there, we, we have, an, uh, we have a, uh, the opportunity to add in an extra uh, sequence of images from the mast, you can see the mast unit in the background there. So the mast will be looking down at this. And actually we did that for the first time with our successful samples that you just saw. Uh, and we checked before it went into the rover and used up the tube. Um, and so when it goes into the rover, what happens? Uh, it goes, it's rotated around into the body of the rover. Uh, that's about the size of your uh, big finger uh, that, uh, and it's made of titanium. Uh, so the net and sample is checked uh, and it's imaged at this point here. And this is where we realize our failure uh, to collect any sample in the first uh, instance. Uh, when we measured the volume and sealed the sample tube and image, we saw only a little bit of dust uh, in the bottom. And then this, uh, the, the uh, rover then transfers it to the back of the rover and it's put into these canisters here. Uh, and each of the sample tubes has a canister. Those canisters can then be jettisoned at any time. We haven't done this step yet, but the idea is that we'll, uh, you move this arm out of the way and then jettison these canisters one at a time. Then they drop onto the surface. Uh, and what's that for? Well, that is because we, the Mars sample return mission will have a microwave size uh, uh, rover that'll sidle up to these uh, samples on the ground and pick them up with its hand. It's got a big arm. Basically, that's all it's got. It's a microwave with an arm. Uh, and it's not as complex as Perseverance, but it'll, it'll be able to go back into the uh, sample return vehicle, which will then ascend up into the Martian atmosphere and escape from, uh, from Martian gravity and go back to Earth with the samples it's collected. So um, we have a lot of flexibility on this, uh, on this sample return, but uh, uh, at the moment we just have these uh, three tubes uh, sealed and ready to go, but um, we're working this weekend actually on, on our next two uh, samples. Dr. Brown, we've got about three minutes to go. There's a lot of interest in the, in the little um, um, drone. Are you able to tell us a little bit more about the, the drone um, that's the um, partner for this project? Yes, yes. So um, let me just... Um... Yeah. And, and how did it fly when the atmosphere is less than 1% of the Earth's atmosphere? How did you guys do that? Tell me. Um, yes. So... Um, yeah, so the drone, um, uh, the drone is called Ingenuity, uh, and it's uh, yeah, it's uh, a, a very light um, uh, a drone that it revs the, the rovers, the, the, it revs the the rotors that it has at twenty eight hundred RPM. Um, and in fact, uh, the, we've we're planning to have the the rove. This is the deployment of the. Uh, Ingenuity onto the ground, onto the surface. And I should point out that at each point when each of these images are taken, the helicopter engineers looked at the image to check every time, <laughs> every deployment stop had happened because they were very worried about things going wrong in here. But fortunately, everything worked well. We got this fantastic first 
selfie. You can see this was taken and um, when the rover hadn't got much just on the surface uh, of it, of it on the top of our uh, um, on on the rover. Um, but then we took this selfie of the uh, uh, of Ingenuity successfully deployed, uh, and we were thinking that it would take five flights. Now up to flight fourteen, uh, and it basically it's pl it plays a game of catch up because it can't go too far away. Just like just like your drone in the backyard in Australia. Um, you don't want to send it over to the neighbor's place, particularly if you've got a big backyard, you'll lose the, your remote control signal. And uh, so we don't want to do that. Uh, and so essentially it, it plays a catch up every 20 souls or so, or depending on how far the rover is moving. We haven't been moving much for the last, for the last little while because we're in a very interesting scientific area. But um, essentially we're, um, we just give it commands to go a little bit further on and catch us up and you know that's how it's got to 14 flights and i'm particularly very interested in the fact that it'll probably be able to get very close to the delta deposits as well so um that'll be very fascinating as we're as we were sidling along the delta uh, is it uh, nuclear powered like also. the rover or where does it get its power from for its flights so it's a it's a solar powered uh helicopter so there's, there's solar on top of the um let me see if we've got it you can sort of see the solar panel on top of ah. uh, the helicopter there. Uh, and it actually has two cameras, essentially the same as your iPhone cameras. Um, it has a color and a, and a black and white camera here. Uh, and um, yeah, and basically those, those um, the, the solar power um, is used by the helicopter. So, and, it's, and essentially it's self cleaning as well. So we don't have any problems with too much dust collecting after you did a, do a flight. It's um, it's all clean up, clean oh. and um, and and I do want to mention one thing because you asked about how it's how how the, the helicopter working is working at the moment and and in fact uh, at the moment it's getting colder at our at our landing site because uh, we're getting through summer uh, and what happens in on uh, on Mars is that during winter uh, the the air actually thins out. Now that's different to Earth, as you'll be able to uh, recall for us, Dr. Carr. So in, on the, in the Earth, we have, uh, if you're a, a pilot, you'll be used to flying in heavier air or thicker air, um, higher pressure air during winter. But that situation is, is reversed on Mars because what's happening during winter is the polar cap is getting all of its material deposited onto it. It has a CO2, it has CO2 ice, and all the CO2 in the atmosphere is getting trapped out into that polar cap. So um, the, during the winter conditions, the air is getting thinner. So the engineers on the helicopter team have designed a, a model for this, and they're actually ramping up their, uh, the rate of the rotation of the helicopter to try and keep the performance of the vehicle uh, about the same rate, as about the same uh, uh, nominal response um, as, uh, as it gets colder. Ah, now here's an out of uh, a weird thought. Would it be possible if you get dust on the lens of the cameras on the rover itself, would it be possible to use Ingenuity's air blast to clean them? <laughs> yes. Uh, well, I mean, it's not impossible, but I will tell you that we're uh, uh, at NASA, we're very. Uh, we're very careful about how uh, close the helicopter can go to the rover. So we never, <laughs> uh, we're never giving the rover any commands to fly over the, the, the rover on the off chance that it's going to fail uh, and collect the rover. So we're quite risk averse in that regard. Uh, and so we, we, the rover keep out, we even have a keep out zone a little bit like an airport or a city or something like that. So you've got to stay away from the helicopter. So we tell the helicopter team, come up with your plans, but make sure you don't go close to the rover. Um, and um, but we do we do have um, on. Um, you mentioned the, the the chance of dust getting into say the the optics and stuff like that. So uh, to get a, uh, to get around um, that problem, the biggest dust problem was when the rover landed on the surface. So as we were landing, all of this uh, material was kicked up. Uh, and basically, let me just show you that video here because it's quite graphic. 
give you an idea of what was happening. This is amazing, well, I mean, um, Adrian. Okay. Uh, as we look yes. at this video, um, definitely play it. But thank you for showing. So think about the ingenuity of the ingenuity. <laughs> it is fantastic. And considering the ingenuity the students have been putting in with their school projects, and we've been able to see a bunch of these uh, projects been sent in, and we're, we're really keen to do a bit of a share. But I must say, this has been fantastic, Adrian. Really, thank you so much. And Carl, uh, love your, uh, your, your taking us into the danger, danger zone <laughs> in one percent atmosphere. Why not? <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. So this is this is our landing sequence, and you can see the rover here uh, going into this uh, uh, dust bowl, if you will. So that that dust bowl to get around the fact that to get around the chance of us uh, getting any dust in and into our optics or anything like that, the, the actual mast was uh, not deployed at this time. So the mast, mast isn't deployed until after the landing has happened and everybody's really super happy. Wow. That is awesome. <laughs> so, well, thank, thank you very much, yeah, um, Dr. Carl and, um, and Dr. Brown. Uh, for that, that was absolutely fascinating. We could talk for hours, and uh, on, um, and maybe in the, in the future we might get you back um, to to talk um, about the uh, where the program is is going. But I'm going to jump over to Ben, who's going to to move into the next section, and I think um, Dr. Carl and uh, Dr. Brown are going to be involved in that as well. Hundred percent, and also uh, Alan Ryan, as well as Ted Tagami, who uh, people will remember from Magnitude.io. Kylie and Glenn have been sort of thinking about iterating school design and seeing some of the designs that we've been seeing is just amazing. So Kylie and Glenn, I'd love to see what you've got to share for us today. Fantastic. Well, given the um, expertise and the discussion so far, it's really exciting to be able to link these concepts to the big ideas that are coming out of the classroom as part of the AVA challenge. So Glenny D is going to just review some of the images that we're seeing um, in designs in moving forward. Once we have a better understanding of the um, atmosphere and conditions on Mars, what we might be proposing to do in terms of um, establishing colonies and life and plant production. So can we have a look at some of the images that have been coming out of our schools in regards to this? Okay. Thanks, Miss B. Uh, we have some, oh, hello to everyone. Thank you again for joining in and our amazing panellists. Remember that uh, they and we all turn up for you because we believe that you will have an amazing career and can do amazing things. So I just wanted to show you quickly something that was sent in from some budding off-earth engineers down at Rayton in Victoria. And the Year 5 girls uh, have been working on underground structures. So all of these are a side view or a section view, a cutaway. So for instance, um, Alice's drawing, you can see a ground line just underneath the plants and everything else is underground. And Beatrix, let's go over to number one. Beatrix, I can see just under the double domes, she has carefully thought about how the plants will be processed, how the harvest will be processed on the belts and where they'll be stored and all of the systems that are going to be needed, Miss B, to maintain all of that. Like, incredible. I want Beatrix, um, Alex, Coco, Olivia and Erin on my team um, if I'm building off-world structures. Thanks, girls, for sending that in. Yeah, it's absolutely fabulous. The level of detail and the systems and, and the, the thinking behind that. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to ask our panellists now in a really quick round is how do these design concepts translate to what they're finding um, in real time in, um, in their experiences with the International Space Station, their work with NASA um, and the Mars rover, and also some Dr. Carl insights into his wealth of knowledge. So what I'm going to bring up now is some of those big ideas that have facilitated these drawings. So Jackie, are we able to? Fantastic. And I'm going to ask the panel, first of all, I think a great place to start would be just looking at the concepts that have come here about creating a dome to sustain life, which is really important. We know that there's water on, on Mars um, and we're also looking at establishing colonies on the moon. What is the likelihood that we would be able to use the physical landforms, um, Dr. Brown, 
that are already on the moon, like the Delta, like how stable is it so that we would be able to anchor some of these design ideas like a dome or filling an existing crater with water by melting ice so it can become an ecosystem? What is the stability? Um, thanks very much, Kylie, for that question. So I, as I was mentioning um, uh, during that uh, intro section, uh, we thought we had a good model for how uh, hard rocks uh, were at our landing site. Um, we were using terrestrial models, uh, terrestrial lavas and stuff like that. But then um, when we've been doing our drilling into the, to the rocks there, we've managed now to, to uh, find that they're actually sometimes softer than any of the rocks that we see uh, here on Earth. So um, that's, uh, that's something that um, we're learning right now, and something that should be able to, to, to use for those, um, uh, for these habitats. And you have to have a, a way of, um, for example, not relying on, uh, on the rocks, so not uh, potentially not building um, something that's on top of that delta or something like that without something, uh, some big trusses down below this, to, to um, potentially hold up the the, uh, the 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 habitat, for example. There's a lot of validity, that might be good really. Idea, in, good idea. Yeah, having the underground elements that the um, students was just drawing. And how does that go, Ted? Um, when we're looking at plant life, so brainstorming around these big ideas. So we understand that there's some limitations in terms of the um, physical structures, but then what does that mean in terms of being able to um, uh, create uh, habitats for plant life? Well, yeah, I think Dr. Adrian Brown um, definitely began talking about it with respect to looking for water, uh, water ice uh, at the Delta. Uh, there's another big challenge in addition to the water for our plants, of course, we'll need that, um, is the sunlight. You have about 45% or so of the sunlight reaching Mars as it reaches Earth. So you've got a lot less light. So that's a challenge, but also the 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 dust and dirt that uh, represent the, the Martian uh, planet surface is, um, has, is full of salt. Uh, and as a little experiment at home, I wouldn't do this in your garden, maybe a little potted area, get two pots, have soil in one and have soil with a little salt in the other. Tell me what happens to that second plant. Um, I don't think the outcome is something you'd like. Salt perchlorates uh, in the soil are going to be a big challenge if you want to try to mix it up and, and grow your, your plants. I like those illustrations. It makes me begin imagining how we might be able to develop a future habitat on that planet. Yeah, and certainly a lot of um, adaptations that plants go through to uh, be able to accommodate um, different levels of salt. So that's really interesting. So the question is, Dr. Carl, as we brainstorm in these big ideas, is it going to be that we're able to adapt to um, Mars and the different space environments like on the moon? Or are we going to have to just drop modular units and hope for the best? So what do you think at the moment is more likely in terms of an outcome? I think we're off to a really good start. <clears throat> and you've got to say A before you can say B. And along the way, you'll make mistakes. And it was very interesting, both what Adrian was saying <clears throat> about the structural integrity of the soil which could range anything from blast grade concrete down to wet sand. And also what Ted was saying about the salt. Now, just a little diversion. <clears throat> Back in the old days, a couple of thousand years ago, when the Romans wanted to be really mean to somebody, not only would they destroy their civilization and kill everybody, they would then go to the trouble of getting this really expensive stuff called salt. And it was expensive then because we get the word salary from salt. Literally, some of these soldiers would be paid in salt as their income, as their, as their pay. And they would get this very expensive stuff called salt and then run it across the fields of the country that they're trying to wipe out so that nothing would ever grow again. So what Ted's talking about there is really clever. And then you can go to the next stage of realising the mechanical and biological limitations and think, how can we work about it? Hooray, biology. So it turns out that a few years ago, two female scientists won the Nobel Prize for discovering a tool for genetic engineering called CRISPR, where you basically just sort of shift things around in the DNA and you can make people shorter or taller or get a Rottweiler over a few months to mutate while it's still alive, say into a Chihuahua. We can't do that now. But I'm sensing 
we're going to need, besides the massive mechanical engineering and the biology, we're going to need the genetics to help us modify the plants so they can grow in the soil and then us so that we can survive there. So like our, our current yeah. design, like two legs, mate, you fall over. I'd like three legs and the brain out in the stick. I'd like it buried in the center of the body. And I'd like to be able to go out on Mars without a spacesuit. We can't get there now, but consider the difference between 100 years ago and now. So biology and genetics will be a big part of our push as we go towards colonization. Yeah, what a fascinating blend between, you know, what we know now and our knowledge and how through processes like the CRISPR we we can actually like change DNA structures for adaption. So it's just so fascinating, such a broad um, area of expertise. So how do we pull it all together? Um, Alan, so we're, we're so interested in this as a project, but the reality is, is that a lot of it has to be mastered on earth and it's a very diverse transdisciplinary team. And I know that you're an expert, so um, in, in project management. So what advice would you give to the students as they're trying to manage these big ideas into an outcome for their projects? Oh, thank you, Kylie, that's great. Um, what I love about the presentation so far is that we've had the big picture view of going to Mars and the rover, and we've also had the small picture view of worrying about the dust on the lens of the camera and how to actually organise and change that. So when you're doing a project, you have to think of the big picture view of all your great ideas and all your great pictures and how you bring it all together. And then you also have to think of the small picture view of how do I actually deliver it on time? Am I delivering what's required by the challenge? Am I doing what's required by my um, teacher? So I just want to share with you just two little thoughts. Can I ask to share the screen, thanks? So firstly, um, I am from the Hargraves Institute, if you can see that. Um, and we're named after Lawrence Hargrave, who was the world's first flyer without hot air in 1893. So Australians have been doing wonderful things for a long time. But what I want to focus you on as all students is just two simple things, is you just need, need to take a step back right now, pause and reflect. And this is when we learn, when we pause and reflect is when we learn and just evaluate how your project is going right now and then iterate to make it better. So evaluate and iterate. And so are you happy with your project? How is your team feeling and your teacher feeling? Right? Does your solution actually answer the problems in the challenge? Right? Are you following a plan? These are the things that you use to evaluate your project rather than the content of it. Um, how can you improve your project? Uh, can it be revised in time to meet the deadline? And we always have to meet the deadline. And what's important to be finished by the deadline? So now's the time to come back to Earth and look at the moon and come back and look at your project and evaluate and iterate to actually have a better project. So thank you. Wow. Thank you. It's a it's amazing to actually see these projects and the actual work that's coming out of the classroom, um, the the curiosity and the actual real science that is, um, you know, influencing their decisions is really powerful. Um, Dr. Brown, Dr. Um, uh, Carl, thank you very much. And Ted Tagami, really appreciate that insight. Uh, back to Ben now for a final wrap, I think, um, before we look at the folio. Sure, no worries. Wendy, uh, we really are. Week, week five, the folio, let's get into it. Oh, let's get into this folio, Ben, definitely. So last week, we um, looked at designing from, with Glenn and Kylie, um, the sketching, and we also talked about computer-aided design tools with Ian and he talked to us about Tinkercad and SketchUp Pro. I kind of talked a little bit about how to train like an astronaut with developing your core muscles using a plank exercise but this week we are definitely going into our evaluating the prototype and I'll just pass over to Mr Preston. Thanks Wendy. Uh, yeah we've got once again a, a great folio for the, the students and the, and the staff out there to uh, work through this week. Um, the, the folios have been a highlight I think as well of, of the ABLE challenge that's been put out. Um, Jackie can we go to the page that shows the ISTEM engineering process? And this was on page four of uh, week one of the folio. So you'll see there we started way back in week one with de defining the, the, the problem that we had 
This week, week five, we're actually looking at three of those COGS. So we're looking down the bottom at COG five, which is prototyping, COG six, which is evaluate, and COG seven, which is iterate, which uh, is, is what Alan spoke about um, the last few minutes as well. If we go back, Jackie, to page 48 of this week's slide, and we'll just bring that one up quickly. So a prototype is where you go, you go and make the, the object and we're going to see whether or not it actually functions the, the way that you hoped it would function. Um, we also, allow, that allows us to uh, empathise with, with our audience perhaps. So if we're making a mobility aid for someone who was disabled and we go and actually try that ourselves, we might empathise with, with what the issues are that they're, they're trying to to, to overcome. Jackie, we also have a slide of the Space Shuttle Atlantis. If you can just throw that one up really quickly. And I mentioned a few, week, a few weeks ago, I was lucky enough to go to the Kennedy Space Center um, in Florida and actually see the Space Shuttle Atlantis. And when I was there, the, the guide was telling me that um, NASA also obviously has to uh, do prototypes and evaluate and, and iterate. And the guide was telling me that the heat shields on the Space Shuttle Atlantis, or the first space shuttles, not the Atlantis, but the first space shuttles, they performed a suction test. And the idea of the, the heat shields is that it protects the, the aircraft, um, particularly on re-entry because it gets so hot. And they did a suction test, which really basically is like putting a vacuum cleaner onto the tiles to see that the glue adhered to the, to, the, to the craft. And they found that several of them fell off. And that put the program back you know, enormously, you know, about 12, 18 months in time. So the students, you're at that stage now of, um, of prototyping, testing, evaluating. Uh, you may not get it right the first time. NASA doesn't get it right the first time. Um, main thing is, is to do your best. Wendy, I'm going to throw to you now for page 49. 49, definitely. Now, this is how you can evaluate your prototype. There are many, many different tools that you can use. I really like the PMI tool, though. So this is where you're going to write down all the plus attributes of your prototype. So write down all of the good things about your design. Then in the minor section, you need to think about, well, you know, what didn't actually perform as well as you thought it was going to be? And then the last part is interesting. So what are some of those observations that, you know, they don't fit into the plus and they don't fit into the minus, but they're interesting. And this is the part where you then continue to change your design to make it better. Um, over to you, Mr. Preston. Okay, thanks, Wendy. So that takes us to page 50 of our folio, which is our, our iterate. So to iterate is to uh, come up with improved versions of, of what we're looking at doing. Um, Jackie, I believe we have an AHA slide, a question for our students today. If we can bring that one up uh, really quickly. I did see a great thing, um, a great show on TV last week about James Dyson, the man who invented the Dyson vacuum cleaner. And I was absolutely astounded to hear that. It took him over 5,000 iterations to get to, um, you know, the, the perfectly functioning um, bagless vacuum. I've got a question up here, and um, Edison, the inventor of the, of the light bulb, the question is, how many times do you think Edison had to iterate before he had success? And, and Jackie, what are our options there? Because I can't see them on my screen. I can see them now. So our options are, do you think... Edison had to iterate less than 10 times, between 11 and 100 times, between 101 and 1,000 times, or more than 1,000 times. Okay, so that's our, our question on our, our poll this week, and I see the results are starting to come through there. I'm very happy to see that there's no for less than 10, and I'm not going to tell you what the actual number was. You can find that out for yourself, but... Um, if you're on that far right-hand column, which uh, is a nice sort of picky colour on my screen, I think you're well and truly in the right, right area. So, Wendy, back over to you. Thanks, Ian. So, in the first week of Train Like an Astronaut, we worked on our strength and coordination through burpees. And last week, we worked on our core muscles through planks. Today, the skill is about agility. So if you have Surf Lifesaving Club at your, in your community, you would understand this one, but you lie down on the ground facing the opposite direction to where you've set up cones in a line. And then when someone says go, you jump up and you have to weave your way through the cones. And the first person at the end is the winner. 
So we would like you this week to set up an Astro Agility course. And then in your folio, it actually gives you some options of how to make that more difficult so that you can build your agility skills. So that's what training like an astronaut is like this week. Um, over to you now, Ben. Uh, absolutely. I hope you are training like an astronaut. Remember, we challenged you to see if you could do some training to reduce your heart rate. How are you going with that? So look, hey, thank you so much. What a really awesome session. I know this has gone a couple of minutes over, but that was the point we wanted to go. This is what's happening up on Mars all the way through to what's happening in schools. So I'd love everyone who's been involved in this particular session to unmute your videos because it's always nice to say hi to everyone. And sadly, say goodbye because next week it is all about communication communicating what we're doing, our pitch and more. So look, thank you so much. Uh, we cannot wait to uh, hang out with you again. Dr. Carl, Dr. Brown, uh, Ted Tagami and all the team. Thank you so much, Alan. Enjoy your day. All the best. This is going to self-destruct. Hope your rockets don't. In five, <laughs> four, three, two, one. We're blasting off. See you guys. <laughs>